Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about the Inguana Lunia Repair. My name is Fatima Shahalamunas from Rudan University. What is an inguinal hernia? An inguinal hernia occurs in the abdomen near the groin area. They develop when fatty or intestinal tissue is pushed through a weakness in the abdominal wall near the right or left inguinal canal. Each inguinal canal resides at the base of the abdomen. Inguinal hernias can be indirect or direct, incarcerated or strangulated. During life, inguinal hernia develops in 25% of men and 2% of women. Indirect inguinal hernia. Hernia passes through the lateral inguinal fossa and inguinal canal and enters the scrotum. It is located with the spermatic cord. Depending on the origin of the urinal sac, oblique hernias may be congenital or acquired. Congenital inguinal hernia is the hernia in which the hernial sac is composed of patent or partially obliterated vaginal processes of the peritoneum. Direct inguinal hernia. The herniated organ passes through the medial inguinal fossa and never enters the scrotum. It is located separately from the spermatic cord. When looking at the differences between the inguinal hernias, indirect hernia and direct hernia, the gate of the indirect hernia is located in the internal inguinal ring and the gate of the direct hernia is in the inguinal space. The sac of the indirect hernia is laterally to spermatic cord and is laterally to inferior epigastric artery. The sac of the direct hernia is medially to the spermatic cord and is medially to the inferior epigastric artery. The form of the indirect hernia is oval and the form of the direct hernia is round. Indirect hernia can be acquired or congenital while direct hernia can only be acquired. Incarcerated inguinal hernia. An incarcerated inguinal hernia happens when tissue becomes stuck in the groin and isn't reducible. This means it can't be pushed back into place. Strangulated inguinal hernia. Strangulated inguinal hernias are a more serious medical condition. This is when intense in an incarcerated this is when inter, intestine in an incarcerated hernia has its blood flow cut off. Strangulated hernias are life threatening and require emergency medical care. Diagnosing inguinal hernias. Your doctor will check for a bulge in the groin area. Because standing and coughing can make an hernia more prominent, you will likely be asked to stand and cough or strain. When it's reducible, you or your doctor should be able to easily push an inguinal hernia back into your abdomen or you're lying down on your back. However, if this isn't successful, you may have an incarcerated or strangulated inguinal hernia. If the diagnosis isn't readily apparent, your doctor might order an imaging test, such as an abdominal ultrasound, CT scan or MRI. Treatment approach Treating inguinal hernia. There are different types of treating in inguinal hernia. So you have open surgeries and laparoscopic surgeries. So traditional hernia repair surgery treats a hernia by repairing the weakness in the abdominal wall. A cut incision is made so that the surgeon has a direct view of the hernia. The repair is then done through this incision. This is called an open surgery. To fix the problem, muscle and connective tissue may be sewn together to make a traditional repair. So there are a few methods of traditional repair, all listed. Most of them are listed here. And in the modern way, options would either include an open inguinal herniography or laparoscopic inguinal herniography. In open inguinal herniography, one larger incision is made over the abdomen near the groin. In laparoscopic inguinal herniography, multiple smaller abdominal incisions are made. This is one of the more modern methods, a laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair or a keyhole surgery. What is a keyhole surgery? Laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair uses an instrument called a lap laparoscope. Between two and four small incisions are made through the abdomen wall through which are passed the laparoscope, a thin telescope with a light on the end and surgical instruments into the abdomen. The incisions are small so the whole technique is often called a keyhole surgery. Conventional surgery is called open surgery. It's also often referred to as a minimally invasive or minimal access surgery. The hernia is then viewed from inside the abdomen from the other side of the abdominal wall. The abdominal cavity is inflated with carbon dioxide gas to give the surgeon space to work inside the patient and the actual operation operating is done remotely with long instruments. The hernia defect or hole is covered with mesh from with 
within the abdomen and staples commonly fired through it into the muscle tissue in order to fix it as a patch. While open surgery is a traditional way to repair a hernia, laparoscopic surgery often allows patients to recover faster and causes less pain. That said, laparoscopic surgery requires that the patient undergo general anesthesia, whereas traditional hernia repair can be done under general region, regional or local anesthesia. Surgery performed under local anesthesia, general surgery is only applied to children of uh, one years old, patients not bearing Novocaine and patients insisting on general anesthesia. So on to the more traditional methods of hernia repair. Firstly, we have Bassini's method. So in Bassini's repair, reconstruction of the inguinal flow by opening the transversalis fascia from the internal inguinal ring to the pubic tubercle, thereby exposing the periperitoneal fat preperitoneal fat, bluntly dissected under the surface of the superior flap of the transversalis fascia, triple layer approximation. The layer of transversalis, fat, transversalis fascia and the transversus abdominis is sutured with the internal oblique muscle to the reflected inguinal ligament. Secondly, we have Massey's repair. In Massey's repair, children and young adults concerned about the long-term prosthetic material, high ligation of the sac and narrowing of the internal ring, Displacing the cord structures laterally allows the placement of sutures through the muscular and facial layers. Next, we have the shoulders repair. So, we have two layers. The continuous running suture reapproximates the inguinal floor. A second layer is started near the internal ring, approximating the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis to a band of external oblique aponeurosis. Superficial and parallel to pool parts ligament, this suture line ends at the pubic crest. A fourth suture line may be added. Next, we have McQuay's repair. Similar to the Bassini's repair, except that it uses Cooper's ligament instead of the inguinal ligament. Interrupted sutures are placed from the pubic tubercle laterally along Cooper's ligament, progressively narrowing the femoral ring. Treatment of femoral hernia. The last stitch in Cooper's ligament is known as a transition stitch and includes the inguinal ligament relaxing incision. Next we have Lichtenstein repair. For the direct hernia, the transversal, a transversal is fascia. Transversalis fascia is dissected above the urinal sac and reduced. The transversalis fascia is sutured by uninterrupted sutures for the bleak hernia after the installation of after the excision of the hernial sac, the deep inguinal ring is restored. Then the transversalis fascia is sutured. A polypropylene mes mesh is used for plastic repair of the hernial ring. It is implanted in the spermatic cord and fixed by uninterrupted sutures to the inguinal ligament. Next is the Spasokokotsky's method. It is performed by stitching the aponeurosis and the muscles together. After penetrating the aponeurosis and the muscles within the needle, it reaches the inguinal ligament. The next one is the Maria Martianov's method. After opening the inguinal canal by dissecting the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle and removing the urinal sac, the superior flap of the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle is sutured up to the inguinal hernia by interrupted sutures. The interior flap is sutured up to the surface of the aponeurosis. It will be duplication of the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. Next we have the Girard's method. It is done by stitching the superior flap of the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle with the inferior margin of the internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscles. The first stage is to assess to access to the muscle and the inguinal ligament. The second stage is to get access to the aponeurosis. And the third stage is the same as Martianov's method, duplication. Next, we have Postyamsky's method. It is performed to close the inguinal canal by moving the spermatic cord laterally. The plastic narrowing of the inguinal ring up to 0.8 cm is the important stage of this modification. On occasion, when superficial and deep inguinal rings are in one plane, the spermatic cord is displaced in the lateral direction by a transverse incision of the internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscles. Then the aponeurosis of the internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscles is fixed to the pectineal ligament. 
Next we have Fukuzanov's method. This method is to restore the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. Sutures are placed between the pectineal ligament, rectus sheath and aponeurosis of the transverse abdominis muscle. Suturing of the transversalis fascia by two mattress, mattress sutures in the left picture, suturing of the sheath of the rectus abdominis muscle and aponeurosis of the internal oblique muscle and transversus abdominis muscle to the inguinal ligament in the right picture. Next, we have Kimbarovsky's method. The margins of the internal oblique and transversus muscles are covered by the superior flap of the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. The needle passes through the aponeurosis muscles and returns to the aponeurosis. Then it reaches the inguinal ligament. Thank you for your attention.